Okay, so welcome to the Spring Term Network, everybody. Um, we're going to have people joining, I think, um, in the next sort of five, ten minutes or so. A few people are going to be joining us a little bit late. Um, for those of you who haven't met me before, I'm Wendy Newton. I'm Head of Children and Young People at Active Surrey. Um, we've got a really, really good agenda for you today. Lots of, um, lots of guest speakers, so you'll be really thrilled to hear. You won't be listening to me for the next two hours. Um, no breakout rooms today. We are just going to run through a series of different presentations. Um, here is the agenda um, for today. I'm quite sure that graphic is in the top right corner, top left corner. But um, so the agenda for today is we're going to start off with a keynote um, and then we're going to move on to a safeguarding update. And then we've got a couple of schools who are going to do some sharing of best practice with you. And then we're going to finish off with um, covering some updates around accreditations that schools can start to apply for. Um, and then a quick update around the school games and the youth games. So it's pretty busy agenda. Um, we will stop for a break kind of midway through just for a bit of a comfort. Um, all slides and the recording will be shared afterwards. So um, without further ado, I'm just going to move on very quickly into just a couple of update slides just around the in sports premium funding um, many of you will be um, used to this slide certainly have shared it before um I'm just going to move on to that um, certainly shared it before what i can't do unfortunately today is give you any news about the in sports premium funding next academic year we still don't know what's happening so um, we will keep you posted and as soon as we hear anything we'll let you know but obviously this academic year, you do still have that funding and there is still a requirement to report on that funding. Um, so when you get these slides through, you'll be able to access the reporting template on the links on this particular slide. And just a reminder of the deadline for that and the expectations of what you need to report on. As we've said many, many times before, it doesn't matter how you report. Um, if you've got your own version of a template, a reporting template, that's fine. But it does need to include all of the things that are in the national template. So just double check. Um, that you've got all of that information in there when you do your reporting at the end of the year. And if you have any problems or any questions or queries, please do come to us um, and we can help you out with that. OK, um, just a couple of things I just wanted to draw attention to. This could be really, really old news for you guys now. Um, you've probably moved on quite a bit and obviously restrictions have lifted significantly. But if you are struggling or you want to access any guidance around what schools and colleges can and can't and should and shouldn't be doing now, um, then there's a link on this slide um, again. And that, that comes to take you straight to the government website with all the, the um, all the guidelines that you're probably very used to and probably quite sick of um, by now. But um, hopefully that those restrictions are now quite limited. So worth have, worth having a look if you're if you've got any questions and queries around that. And then the other thing that I just wanted to draw your attention to is um, a new um, new guidelines that have come out very recently um, from a report that has been done. This is around provision for young people with disabilities. Um, and this is about um, some resources and things that are available and some guidelines as to what young people with disabilities should have access to. Um, so the information is there on the slide. And again, you can click on these links and you can go directly to this information. Um, but again, this comes from, from Chief Medical Officer. So this is very similar to what we the principles that we've been working to for a long time around 30 minutes a day or 60 minutes a day, but 30 minutes a day sitting with this, that responsibility sitting within schools. So this is just kind of an extension of that, but a real, um, a real focus on young people with disabilities. So those are the only updates that I've got for you today in terms of the national perspective. As I said earlier, with regards to PE and sports premium funding, we are still awaiting um, an update on that. Uh, we're also still awaiting on an updated version of the School Sport and Activity Action Plan, um, which gives us further insight as to what funding will be coming out in the future, what the school games organiser network and the school games programme looks like and all those sorts of things. But for this academic year, it's business as usual, and we will talk about the School Games programme a little bit later on. So what I'm going to do now, without further ado, is introduce our keynote speaker, who I'm pretty sure is definitely on the call. So I just want to introduce Jamie Thurston from 52 Lives. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen now, Jamie, and allow you to share your slides. And hopefully we'll be able to spotlight you at the same time. Okay, I will 
attempt to share my screen. <laughs> So um, just to introduce Jamie, she's um, she's from 52 Lives and um, we were actually privy to a presentation that she did around the School of Kindness um, at a network some time ago. And we thought it was a really great idea, concept, and it links very nicely with physical activity. So welcome, Jamie. And I'm going to hand over to you to run through things. And then at the end of your session, we've got an opportunity for some Q&A with, with the schools. Thanks, Wendy. Um, yeah, so my name is Jamie and I'm the founder and chief exec of 52 Lives, um, which is a kindness charity. And we also have the School of Kindness, which we're gonna, I'm going to explain to you a little bit about today. So I was going to talk to you a little bit about, first of all, about the background of the charity and so you can understand our philosophy a little bit. And then I'll talk about what we are doing in schools. Um, so the charity began um, kind of by accident, to be honest. I didn't really intend to set up a charity. It, um, I came across a wanted ad on a website. It was a lady who was looking for rugs um, to cover her broken floor. And the ad sounded quite desperate. And so I got in touch with the lady and said, you know, I didn't have a rug, but I said, if somebody donated one, maybe I could pick it up for her. Um, and we got chatting and I learned more about her situation. And she'd escaped a really awful domestic situation. Um, her and her children, had been homeless for a little while, they'd lived in somebody's garden shed for a little while. Anyway, they'd finally been given housing, but they didn't have very much and they really didn't have anybody to help them. And I just remember thinking if people, if people knew about her, I know so many people who'd be willing to help. And, um, and so that's what I did. I sent an email around to, you know, the other parents at school and to my family and friends. And I did a collection for this lady and we delivered all the things to her one day. And she was, well, she was in tears at the door when we delivered all the things and you know I realized it quite quickly it wasn't the stuff that I was giving you know it wasn't amazing stuff it was secondhand bedding and bits and pieces it was just the fact that people cared about her um you know she'd been treated quite badly in her life and she just couldn't believe that people she didn't even know would be would be that kind to her and would be wanting would be willing to help her um and I remember she sent me an email later on and and this was one of the things that she said in the email such a random act of kindness but it totally restored my faith in humanity, because that's what kindness does to people. I think it helps them see that the world is a good place again. Um, and I just felt really inspired, I guess, and decided to set up a little Facebook page and I called it 52 Lives. And I thought every week I can find someone who needs help and between my friends and family, maybe we can do some small things to help people. Um, but it- That really not work so much. Oh, sorry. Um, and um, so that's how it works now every week people can nominate someone who needs help and we share their story on our website and our social media pages and request what they need it's normally a mixture of donations gifts from a wish list and kind messages and the idea is to try and help change someone's life every week and spread a bit of kindness um, so it started as a small Facebook page but over the years um, we gained a lot of publicity and we've ended up with, we have almost 100,000 people now across our social media channels. Um, we gained the support of the Duke and Duchess of Sussex a couple of years ago. Um, we've been on all sorts of um, TV shows and, and in the media. And um, I think one of the reasons that, you know, it's, it's a very simple idea, you know, it's not that revolutionary trying to help, <laughs> trying to help people and provide things for people. But I think um, what, what it does is it gives people a really simple and really tangible way to help people and 100% of what people give goes to the people we're helping so it's very transparent. Um, so over the years we've helped with all different things we've um, we help anybody in need of kindness so we've um, provided furniture and carpet and things for for people fleeing domestic violence we've paid for operations we've bought wheelchairs for people we um, helped a homeless mum and son off the street it's literally anything and everything we've helped. Um, I'm going to give you a couple of quick examples before I go into what we're doing in school. So this was a boy we helped a few years ago called Mason. Um, Mason has all sorts of health issues um, and he was living with his grandparents because his um, parents weren't able to care for him. And one of the things that Mason really loved was being outside, but this was his grandparents' garden and it really wasn't very accessible at all for his wheelchair, which they really struggled with because they felt bad that they couldn't help him get access um, to outside space. So um, we raised funds and managed to create this amazing sensory garden, um, which you know, didn't just help Mason, also helped his grandparents, because when you help, we've well, we found very, every person we help, when you help one person in the family, it lifts the whole family. 
Um, last year during lockdown, we received uh, these photos from a social worker and she asked if we could help um, to create a nicer bedroom for the young boy that lived in this room. Um, he was really struggling with his mental health. He caused a lot of the damage um, to the room and then regretted it and, you know, but he was living in, he, he was really struggling. And he was living in this environment during lockdown, which really wasn't doing his mental health any favors. So we shared his story and all of our supporters, um, oh my goodness, within about an hour, I think we raised enough money to, um, we had to redo the electrics and we redid the plastering and painted and everything. So on the left is after we painted and done the electrics and on the right is after his bed was delivered. Um, we don't have any more photos because his social worker said he started getting very proud of his room and quite private and didn't want photos taken. So we didn't want to infringe on that. But, um, you know, he now even, as well as the furniture, we were able to get him like storage furniture because he had nothing in his room, um, books and toys. We bought him a computer to help with his schooling, all sorts of things. Um, but what we do for people, we, so we give people tangible help, we give people stuff, but we, our philosophy is much deeper than that. We hope that um, what we really do is help people feel like they're not alone and that the world's a good place. So um, this was a quote from a, a lady that we helped recently as well, who'd recently lost um, lost a baby and was really struggling financially as well. Um, and, you know, all of our support, all of the people we help, sorry, say, say the same thing. That isn't just the things that we're giving them that are changing their life, it's the kindness. Um, I'm going to show you a little video, which I'm hoping, I'm hoping you can hear the sound on. Um, basically, this is the lady called Heather that we helped. Um, Heather had a terminal illness and she was treated really badly in a beauty salon that she went to with her daughter. Um, I read about Heather actually, normally most of the people we help are nominated, mostly our nominations come from social workers, other charities and teachers are our three main people who nominate. Um, but I read about Heather in a newspaper and really felt for her so I reached out to the family to see if we could help. Anyway she got treated really badly in a beauty salon um, and I reached out to see if we could do something for her, maybe get her a voucher for a different salon or something so she could have a nice day out. And her family said that all she would like is cards. So all of our supporters made cards for her, but we also found out that she was a big fan of Michael Ball. Um, and so we managed to arrange this for her. Tell me if the sound doesn't work and I'll try and fix it. Mm -hmm. oh. So we do we do all sorts of things for people and not all of it costs money um because that's something that we've definitely learned some of the things that we do that have the most impact on people haven't cost anything at all um now so that's a bit of a background to the charity now in terms of our work in schools um a few years ago we launched a school of kindness and it started because i was asked to give a few talks in some assemblies at my children's school about the charity and while i was there some of the children were asking me about questions about some of the people we'd helped and so I was telling them a few stories and it really just evolved from that because then, then some of the children said, can we make cards for them? And I was like, of course you make cards for them. And just some of the ideas and things that they were coming up with made me think, wouldn't it be, I'd love to do this properly as a proper workshop in, in schools, um, which we didn't have any funding for. And then um, I, won a, I won a prize. It was the Clarence Woman of the Year Award and it came with prize money, which we used to launch our School of Kindness. So every week we um, run free kindness workshops in primary schools for key stage one and two. Um, we're starting to develop a workshop for early years as well, but at the moment it's key stage one and two. Um, the workshops, Ooh. sorry, I'm really bad at power, my goodness. oh my goodness. <laughs> right, it's not gonna touch anything. Um, 
So the workshops teach the kids all about the benefits of kindness, um, which, you know, obviously there's social benefits and, and, you know, it creates stronger communities and things. And there's obviously benefits for other people, but we also talk to them about the impact that kindness has on our physical health and our mental health. Because lots of people think that kindness is just about, you know, doing nice things for people and isn't that a nice thing to do. But there's been a lot of research into the science of kindness and the chemical changes it causes in our body and the impact it has on our health. So we really want to help children realize that um, that they have the power not just to help other people but also to do really simple things to improve their own physical and mental health anytime they want to. Um, the, the School of Kindness, has, so we have free kindness workshops which we run virtually and face-to-face -face now. We're going to carry on doing virtual for as long as or forever. Um, um, we only started doing it because of COVID but um, it means that we can reach a lot more children. We used to work with maybe about 5,000 children a year and last year we we worked with 50,000 children. So it just expands our reach hugely. Um, we also have a lot of free teaching resources on our website, um, video lesson plans and all sorts of things that teachers can use that are all linked to the curriculum as well. And we also have a free kids kindness club. So every fortnight children are sent uh, an email newsletter which has kindness challenges, they can earn kindness badges. And it's always a mixture of things that are things about being kind to themselves things about being kind to other people and things that are being kind to the planet. So we try and do, um, to do all three. Um, so within our school workshops though, we, as well as teaching the kids about the benefits of kindness, we then also go into the science of kindness and the impact it has on their physical and mental health. And then we give them a practical task, which is to, we tell them about a real person who needs help and they go away and do something to help that child. And I'll just, I'll just kind of run through a little bit of the science that we teach kids in the workshop so you can get an idea of what we do. Um, so I don't normally teach the workshops by the way, so forgive me if I'm not doing this properly. Um, so we teach them about the social benefits of kindness that improves relationships, strengthens our community and helps other people. And we, you know, give them case studies and things like that for 52 lives. So they're the, they're the more obvious things we teach them about kindness, but then we go into the science of kindness and we talk to them about the impact that it's having on, on the chemicals in our body and our health. So for example, when we're kind, um, it, releases dopamine in your brain which gives you a natural high and you know I think we know that when we're kind it feels good but there's science behind why it feels good and that's what we're trying to help them understand what's actually going on in their bodies so you know one of the things that one of the questions that we got asked a lot anyway during lockdown was about what can people do you know to 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 feel better and how do you what's the best way to cope with lockdown and the simplest thing <laughs> the simplest thing people can do to cope with a difficult situation is think about what you can do to help somebody else because as soon as you're thinking about what you can do to help other people and being kind it takes you out of your own head for a little while and releases these amazing chemicals in your body that help you feel happier um, kindness gives us healthier hearts so it causes the release of oxytocin which then brings about the release of a chemical called nitric oxide which expands your blood vessels reduces blood pressure and protects your heart so kindness is um known now as being a cardioprotective act which is, i just think is incredible <laughs> the more i've learned about the science of kindness um yeah it, blow, it just blows me away we've got an amazing scientific advisor called dr david hamilton who um, has written lots of books about the science of kindness it's fascinating if anybody wants to read anything else about it he's definitely a good person to follow um kindness slows aging at, at the source so um, oxytocin reduces the levels of free radicals and inflammation in your body, which are the th two things that really age your body. So it slows aging at the source, um, which also helps you live longer. Um, and the final one that we teach kids is that kindness is contagious. And, you know, kids were very familiar with our numbers um, <laughs> recently. So there were some studies into the R number of um, kindness and it's between four and five. So when you're kind to one person, um, Research has shown that it will positively affect up to 125 people because when you're kind to someone, they're more likely to go on to be kind to somebody else and it spreads out up to three degrees of separation. So we teach the children that it's not just, um, you know, one small act that you're doing. You're helping to create a kind of classroom. You're helping to create a kind of school and ultimately a kind of world. Um, and that it doesn't have to be big things because, you know, some of the examples that we give to children in the workshops so things which she loves has done have been big grand gestures and we really try and ram home in the workshops that it's not it doesn't have to be big things you don't have to start a charity you don't have to donate money it's all the little interactions that you have in your daily life um, that, that determine you know what your house is like and what your community is like and what your school's like 
and we also talk to them a little bit about dealing with unkind people which is more challenging it's easy to be it's easy to be kind to kind people <laughs> it's more challenging to be kind to unkind people but um so we talk to them about i don't know negative thinking and about um about how it's often people who are unkind who need kindness the most um because behavior breeds behavior maybe the people who are unkind go home and nobody's ever kind to them maybe you know they're struggling with something so we try and deal with um we try and talk to them about dealing with challenging people as well um so yeah these are the three main resources we have we've got free school workshops free teaching resources and our free kids kindness club um it, we can provide it all for free because we have a sponsor who covers all of our costs because we really didn't want cost to be a barrier in schools um getting involved in and kids getting involved with our kindness clubs and things um the only thing i say about our school workshops they are um, incredibly booked up at the moment. I think we're taking bookings for September at the moment, but we are um, taking on some new workshop facilitators so that we can um, say yes to more schools that are wanting to work with us. Um, and that's it. So I feel like I've um, I feel like I've rambled and jumped all over the place in that. But if anybody's got any questions, please just feel free to ask. No rambling whatsoever, Jamie. That was really <laughs> interesting. Thank you. Made me smile a lot, actually. Um, does anybody have any questions um, for Jamie around the, um, I suppose, particularly around the offer for schools and the workshop side of things? You can put them in the chat or you can be brave and unmute yourselves. It was faster than I thought. I was trying to... Um... I can hear my youngest child trying to come up the stairs and I was trying to get through it before he burst in. They're all going to be very quiet, it looks like, today. That's right. If anybody has any questions after, they can always contact oh, There's a question from, from Quickie. What is, the, what is the process for booking a kindness workshop, Jamie? Oh, there's so um, we've got two different websites. All of our school stuff is on our School of Kindness website. So if you go to schoolofkindness.org, um, it's really easy to find, just click on workshops and there's a booking inquiry form and you can request if you want a face-to-face -face or a virtual workshop and all the resource, all the teaching resources and things like that are on there. We also often run kindness challenges in schools so, um, so that schools can take part in. So like over Easter, there's an Easter kindness challenge. We had a random out of kindness week challenge. It's just activities that the kids can do during the holidays and they can win prizes and things. We've realized um, that prizes help. <laughs> help a lot with engagement with children any kind of prize or badge that they can win yeah definitely um there's a couple of comments you're saying that was fantastic thank you very much definitely something they're going to look into um jackie we'll share the um we'll share the website link afterwards when we share the slides and things like that and um, uh, jamie just one question for me i suppose how does the kind of science side of it land with the children does it is it tricky to get them to understand that because obviously the slides you've just presented to us quite the, the language and stuff is obviously uh, adult based um, or, or for us, but um, how do you kind of get that across to the children? Yeah, um, it's, but for key stage one and two, it's fine. Sometimes the schools were putting early years in and it just was, you know, it's, it's too hard, but um, our workshop facilitators um, are very good at making it more child friendly. And the slides that we use in the schools are slightly more child friendly, yeah, um, sure. but they, yeah, they, they, they get it pretty easily, actually. Once you once you break it down and explain it quite well, um, and yeah, our two workshop facilitators that we have at the moment are are incredible. Um, I occasionally go to the workshops if they're nearby um, and do a little Q and A at the end sometimes with the kids. And yeah, uh, there's actually um, I was just going to say because I had a look on your website when when I was preparing the slides for today and obviously there's a little video on your website of some of the um, workshop stuff being delivered in school so you can have a little look at that as well on the website that's um that's quite good to see i think the connection for us with this just in terms of you talking about the science and stuff is with some of the training that we offer to schools around um well-being and obviously getting children to understand in a different way the connection between physical activity and their mental health so it's a very similar thing to that and, and that's fundamentally why we kind of asked you to come and present today because there is a connection there and there is a science behind it that both teachers and young people probably don't necessarily understand. I've certainly learned something new today. So, Yeah, and one of the other things that we talk about, um, when we talk about self-kindness a lot with children and looking after themselves, because when, we're look, when we look after ourselves, 
when we're in a much better position to then go out into the world and be kind to other people. And um, that covers a whole range of things from exercise, nutrition, sleep, all of those things about all these different ways that we can be kind to ourselves, which, mm. um, you know, and not just about helping ourselves because if we're helping ourselves, then it's actually helping everybody around us as well. So yeah. we try and create a lot of connections um, during the workshops as well. Fantastic. Okay, um, if there's no other questions for Jamie, I think we'll probably move on to our next um, next section. But thank you very much, Jamie, for your time. You're very welcome to um, to stay on for the rest of the network. I'm sure you're a very busy lady. So if you disappear, we won't take offence. But thank you for your time today. <laughs> thank you. Okay, I am just going to go back to my slides now. Um, and uh, Jude, um, if you uh, are still on the call, which I hope you are, um, if you can um, switch your camera on, then we'll be able to spotlight you for your slides. Um, bear with me one second. So just to introduce our next speaker, um, moving on to a slightly different topic now, but obviously um, links to, um, to children. We've asked um, Jude um, Tosland to come along from um, NSPCC just to give a bit of an update around safeguarding. We haven't done anything on safeguarding um, at our networks in a while. So Jude has very kindly come along, um, um, agreed to come along and just give a bit of an update and share a few slides with you today. So again, Jude, um, welcome. And uh, I'll let you run through your presentation and then any questions and things um, from any of the schools, pop them in the chat or you can um, ask Jude at the end of her presentation. Thank you very much. Absolutely. And I've allowed some time for questions at the end, but uh, but do ask questions as we go as well. So I, I'll keep my eye on the chat so I can uh, pick up things as we go. So just uh, just kind of anything that you think of, just ask me. Um, so I'm, as so I say, Jude Tosland, I'm from the Child Protection and Sport Unit. Um, actually, if you go to the next slide, that's a, a website screenshot from our, our website. And I've, I've just put in the chat the website address because we've got quite a lot of information on there that you might find useful. Now, if you haven't come across the Child Protection and Sport Unit, uh, we've been going for about 21 years, actually. We were set up by a partnership between Sport England and the NSPCC. Um, and it was in response to a number of concerns across sport. Uh, there was a feeling that we really needed to have a specific unit that looked at safeguarding in sport. And now we've extended our remit and we're looking at sport and physical activity uh, and keeping children safe across those sectors. Um, we have funding from Sport England, from Sport Wales and from Sport Northern Ireland as well as UK Sport. We don't cover Scotland but we do work in partnership with Children First uh, who are the Scottish equivalent of the NSPCC. Um, but as I say the, the website address is in the chat and we've got a lot of tools, resources, templates, podcasts and things that you can access so there's quite a lot of material there because obviously I'm just going to touch on a few nuggets today um, but if you're in, in any of them are fire up your imagination then please go onto the website and have a look. Um, so next slide please, I'm gonna, just going to talk about what, what I'm going to cover, what I'm going to cover in the next quarter of an hour or so. Um, I'm going to start off just a little bit about why, the why safeguarding, why it's important. Uh, probably it was it's something, it's a question that's just obvious to you, but I will go through that um, and why we think it's, it's something that every organisation needs to take seriously and be responsible for. And then a little bit about what you might be doing already. And I've got some questions I'm going to pose to you just to, to help you think about what have you got in place in your organisation? Maybe think about there might be some gaps, there might be some areas you'd like to develop further. So, so I'll just pose some of those questions. Um, and then how could you improve safeguards? Um, I've got one resource to a couple of resources actually to share with you that are from our website. And I will give you more information about where you can get hold of those too. Um, and I can signpost you to, to other places to go for different resources. Um, and then we'll finish up with some questions. So I'm, I'm really hoping you have some nice, interesting questions for me uh, for the end of the, the session. Okay, next slide, please. 
So the first thing is the why, the why safeguarding. Um, and I know that's something that you're thinking, well, of course, why, why not? Um, but the word safeguarding can be quite confusing. A lot of people use the word safeguarding and child protection interchangeably. And what I tend to think of is if you're thinking of a child who is standing on the top of a cliff and you don't want that child to fall off, you will put some nice strong barriers around the top of that cliff. Now they are your safeguards, they're preventing the child coming to harm. Um, and so that might be codes of conduct, that might be policies and procedures. But if the child does get through one of those barriers, falls off the cliff, then you need a really strong safety net to catch them at the bottom. That's your child protection. So child protection is the procedures that, cut, that kick into place when there are concerns about a child. They're part of safeguarding. So I think it's, it's always useful to make that distinction because I know sometimes people get a bit confused about the term safeguarding. So why safeguarding? Well, I'll tell you, what, if you could click on, um, now I think probably, yes, probably a couple of clicks actually. Um, because it'd be useful to go through both the risks and the benefits. People tend to focus on the risks of safeguarding. They'll always think about what goes wrong. And in fact, with safeguarding, you don't get many rewards for doing things well. You do get a lot of penalties for doing things badly. Um, so financial risk is a primary one. We know that quite often funding streams are they they actually ask organisations to have safeguards in place. Insurance quite often now will ask for a, a good clear safeguarding or a child protection policy and procedure. So there are financial implications if you don't have that in place. But there's also reputational or um, damage because if your organisation was not managing something very well, a safeguarding concern, something went badly wrong, that would have a knock-on effect on your reputation. So reputational risk is a significant concern. And then the legal side of things. Um, so I'm sure many of you will have done some safeguarding training and looked at some of the legal requirements around safeguarding. The main legal um, guidance that we refer to is something called working together to safeguard children. Um, and there's also keeping children safe in education is the most recent guidance and that's also very helpful. Both those documents give clear guidance to organisations to everything that needs to be put into place for all organisations working with children. Um, so there are so and if you again if you don't follow those procedures you could actually there could there could be legal consequences of that. So as I say, there's a lot of emphasis on risk, but people don't often think of the benefits of safeguarding. And what we've found is that by creating a fun and a safe environment for children, they're more likely to participate. So you're, you're more likely to keep their engagement, to keep them um, can, coming along and performing and enjoying what they're doing. They're also likely to perform their best, so they're more likely to perform well if they're feeling safe and they're feeling secure in their environment. There's been some research by the University of Birmingham, um, for, it's called Empowering Coaches, and they looked particularly at football um, and they found both an increase to participation, but also to performance when children were feeling empowered and they were feeling safe. But then the other side of the reputational risk, as an organisation, you'll get a positive reputation. This is a good place to go. This is a safe environment. Parents are getting increasingly canny about safeguarding and child protection within organisations. They're more likely to send their children to somewhere which feels safe. Um, so having a positive reputation is a, is a really important side of things. But, but ultimately, why safeguarding? We want to keep children safe. We want to make sure that children are not harmed. Um, and so that has, and so, so the child protection side of things and child's welfare has to be absolutely at the heart of everything we're doing. So then in the next slide, there are some screenshots of a few 
issues that have come up um, and these are I could have picked so many I just kind of went online and had a look at some of the issues um, you'll see bottom left is Barry Bennell now you won't have been able to avoid Barry Bennell um, he was a scout for for various different football teams um, and uh, his abuse was prolific but we may not have realised quite the extent of that if it wasn't for Andy Woodward who came forward on Victoria Derbyshire's show in 2016 and talked about his abuse by Barry Bennell. And that led to a huge number of um, ex-footballers talking about their experiences of abuse. The NSPCC had a helpline to, to uh, take some of those concerns. And there was a report called the Sheldon Report that was released last year with a multitude of recommendations, both for the FA, but also right across sport and physical activity. And that includes things like involving parents, talking to children, um, and making sure that children are at the heart of everything we're doing. Um, but also leading from the top so everybody needs to be involved. So there's a safe culture that, leads, that goes through organisations. And then more recently, you'll have been aware of concerns around gymnastics so there was uh, athlete a was in on netflix that led to a raft of concerns being raised by young gymnasts um, and a helpline was set up again nspcc in partnership with uk sport and the british athletes commission set up a helpline and we're expecting the white report to report later on this year with some key recommendations as well. And these recommendations, although they're about gymnastics, they will have an impact right across sport and physical activity. But it's not just the big ones. You'll see that uh, there's a couple of cases there that I've picked out. It's a teacher who was sexually abusing girls um, and, a, and a PE teacher who abused a pupil. Uh, and it's not just about sexual abuse as well, because sexual abuse tends to get a lot of the press. Uh, but in the gymnastics case, cases there were concerns around poor practice um, a lot of concerns around emotional abuse um, inappropriate weighing overtraining training on injuries so uh, some really important uh, concerns there so moving on to the next slide I was just going to think about what you might be doing already um, so I'm just going to, I'm not expecting you to answer these, but I'm, I'm going to pose a few questions to you about what you might have already in your organisation. So most organisations, they have safeguarding policies and procedures, um, and they're great, that's really important. However, a policy and procedure on its own isn't really enough, it needs to actually be, be a living document it might be on a website it might be on a shelf but people actually need to know about it so my first question to you was do you have safeguarding policies and procedures do you know where they are would you know where to find them do parents and do other people know what to do if they have a concern so that's something to have a think about um, every organization we recommend has somebody who has a lead role around safeguarding a designated safeguarding officer and I know in, in schools, there'll always be a designated safeguarding officer. But one thing I always think about, what happens if that person wasn't there, if they're on holiday, if they went off sick? Uh, it's always important to have backups as well. So have a think about in your organisation, have you got a backup? Have you got a deputy that could cover? And then we always suggest that they, there needs to be robust codes of conduct. So the rules, so what you can, what you should, and what you should not do. So, but does everyone know what they are? Do they actually have to sign up to them? And is it clear what the consequences are if they are breached? So codes of conduct should all, always be tied in with clear disciplinary processes and, and um, the consequences of any breaches should be taken very seriously. So they're not just something to tick a box. Training, I mean, you're here today, which is fantastic. Um, and I, it is very important to keep up to date with safeguarding issues. So we've got some information on our website, which you can um, find out. We've got a number of different webinars and podcasts you can access. But there are other resources out there, particularly some of the more specialist areas. So if you're interested in, for example, child exploitation, there's an organisation called the National Working Group that provides some specific training. 
if you'd be interested in learning a little bit more around adult safeguarding. And I know you're working with children, but you may also be interested in working in, in look at the adult side. The Ancraft Trust are an organisation that provide some resources and training around uh, safeguarding adults. And then there's safe recruitment procedures. Now, some people think safeguarding is disclosure and barring service checks, DBS checks. And that's actually just one part of safer recruitment. And that is one part of safeguarding, but it is a really important part. Um, but how do you make sure that you have the best people working with children? So how do you make sure that you have the right people? They have the right training, they have the right qualifications, they've got the right insurance, um, and that you, they are monitored and they, are, they have to keep to certain codes of conduct. So it's not just DBS. If you are interested in disclosure and borrowing service checks, which is a whole course on its own, we actually have a couple of podcasts on our website. Um, so you can access those. We've got one on the basics of DBS and one about some of the frequent asked questions on DBS. So that might be something you'd be interested in. And then one, a, a particular one which might be of interest to you is do you have clear arrangements when you're working in partnership? So it might be you're working in a partnership maybe your organisation and Active Surrey, or there might be other organisations working in partnership together. Do you have some clear agreements about how you work together? I will come on to talk a little bit more about that and show you some templates about how we, some templates from our website where you can access some of this information. And then finally, but I think most importantly, do you have a culture where children are listened to? and where they are involved. We know that if children are in an environment where people take them seriously, people ask their opinions, people listen to them, they are more likely to tell us when they have, some, have a serious concern. So if you listen to them about the little things, they'll tell you about the big things. So a culture where children are listened to, really important. So if you could move on to the next slide, I'll just have a little bit of thinking about what you could improve. So I mentioned partnership agreements. Um, what I will put into the chat is I've got a link to um, a resource that we have. It's called our partnership check and challenge tool. Um, and this is something that it's quite useful for organizations who are working in partnership to go through this tool before the activity, before anything starts, because it takes you through things like, OK, so who is responsible for safeguarding? If there was an incident, who would be leading on the incident? If there was a child missing, who would lead on, on that? Whose codes of conduct are we following? Um, and and so, what, so what are some of the regulations? So the partnerships agreement is, is, should be really use, could be really useful. Um, communication is very helpful to think about how you're communicating with different different partners. So that might be partner agencies, that might be with parents, that might be with young people themselves. So thinking about your communication style, we're looking for something which is accessible um, for children. You could actually involve children in designing communication and resources so to make sure that they are child focused. And you may be doing this already. And if you are, uh, please feel free to share that in the chat, because I think it's great to share some of these resources and what you're doing already. Um, the involving children and young people side of things is, is uh, ever so important. Again, we've got some information and we're actually developing more resources on our website about this. Um, but some people, they have uh, youth ambassadors, so they have young people that are doing quite well. And they are, in, in, they are asked to talk to some of the other young people. So some, young, sometimes children hear messages more from other young people than someone old like me. So I think you know, involving young people, to talk to young people is also really helpful. Getting young volunteers involved. You may have young people in planning groups or, plan, or leading activities. Or it might be as simple as, what are we going to do for our warm up? and getting young people to select that. And then I mentioned safer recruitment. And so we've also got some recruitment checklists um, on our website as well. So you may find some of those useful to think about what you ask and who you ask it of. 
So on the next slide, there's just an example of, of, what, of what I've been talking about. So I know it's going to be difficult to see in your screens. That is actually the link I've put through the partnership check and challenge. And that's a couple of rough questions that you've got one around managing allegations and concerns and one around the duty of care. So it starts to get you to think, okay, what do we need to think about before we do this partnership working? Who's gonna take a lead on it? How are we gonna to work together on this? And then the next slide has got um, the recruitment checklist that I mentioned. So that's particularly looking at different parts of the recruitment um, stages. So you may be talking about um, getting a job description, you may be talking about advertising, um, interviews, taking references. So they're all part of the step, they're all stages and DBS checks is one part of that stage. We have got a whole section actually on the website on safer recruitment. So again, um, do, do go and have a look if that's something you're interested in. So I've thrown lots of information at you and lots of questions. Um, no questions have come through to me into the chat at the moment, but this is really your opportunity to, to ask me any questions. If there's, is there a burning question around safeguarding that, uh, that you'd like to ask me? You can either, as I said before, you could, you could unmute or you could put things into the chat and I'll, uh, I'll do my best to answer them. And if I can't answer questions straight away, I, I, I will uh, look up some resources and put them into the chat for you. Thanks, Jude. That was great. Um, I think I just wanted to um, encourage people to ask any questions they may have, but just maybe um, thinking about using um, external coaches and external activity providers. Um, schools who are doing that, um, this kind of inf this is one of the reasons that we asked you to come along to do this kind of update, because obviously we know that as schools, as Jude said at the beginning, you will have a safeguarding lead, you have um, policies and procedures probably coming out of your ears in terms of safeguarding. That side of things is probably taken care of by your senior leadership teams. Um, but in terms of your roles as PE leads within schools and working with external coaches and providers, there is a safeguarding responsibility, obviously, and particularly around the recruitment and the deployment of those coaches and making sure that you are doing the right checks, not just for qualifications, which is something that we always talk about, but also around um around the safeguarding side of things and obviously the necessary checks so i don't know if there's any schools on on the call who are working with external coaches who want to ask any kind of questions around that side of things um, i can't see the chat feed at the moment so i don't know if there's any questions coming through but there's um, nothing so far you just shared the links to to um to the toolkits and things like that i suppose a question that i thought of um jude when you started to talk about resources and templates and things um one of the, one of the the websites that we quite often signpost schools to when they're working with external providers is uk coaching mm. um because they've got a coaching in primary schools toolkit um i, I, I assume that some many of these templates are very very similar they're all they're all going through very similar checklists and things like that Yes, and in fact, we work closely with UK Coaching, they're one of our key partners, and we work with them to develop the Safeguarding and Protecting Children course um, that, that uh, I know many coaches and PE teachers will have already will have done. Um, and UK Coaching has some really good resources on their website. Um, so they're, they're, they're coming at it very much from a, a coach, teacher, instructor yeah. perspective. Um. Michelle, your question, is there a Surrey directory of external sports providers who we know are applying these safeguarding procedures? I'm guessing you're asking about, um, I guess, um, accredited um, providers. This is an area that, that came up uh, many years ago, actually, when schools started to receive funding to enable them to employ external providers. Um, and something that was discussed locally and nationally across the country as to whether or not we could come up with a directory locally and nationally of providers who we could endorse. And because safeguarding is obviously such a minefield, um, the ultimately the decision was taken that we wouldn't be able to do that kind of endorsement and that it is ultimately down to schools to do their own checks. The reason being is that we could rubber stamp an organisation based on a conversation and a checklist that we have with them. Um, but then the coaches that come into your schools could end up being completely different personnel. 
So there are lots and lots of guidance and toolkits that you can use. But I guess the, 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 the straight answer to your question is no, it is the responsibility of the school to check. That said, we obviously do know organisations, particularly in Surrey, who are working across a number of schools that we would recommend, but we would, we, we would not then actually, we would still expect schools to do the relevant checks themselves. So I think that probably answers your question. Thank you. Okay, any other questions for Jude? Any questions from my team? And if you go on to the next slide, it's actually got my contact detail, our contact details as well, which is just the website that we've given. But uh, so if people do think of questions afterwards and think, oh, God, I wish I'd asked for that, you can always uh, get in touch through our, we've got an inquiry form on our website. OK, great. Thank you very much for your time, Judge. That was really useful. Um, and obviously the slides, as I said at the beginning, will be shared. So all the links and the contact details um, that, that Jude has shared um, in the last 15 minutes or so will all be available to you. OK, uh, we're just a roundabout coming up for halfway, I think, probably just under. Um, so uh, at this point, we're just going to take a very quick comfort break um, for anybody who needs it, wants to stretch their legs, grab a drink, etc. So if we just take five minutes um, and we come back um, just before five, then we can move on to the next section.
Okay, um, hopefully everybody's back. Um, I have very few people on camera, so it's hard to tell, but I think we're going to crack on. Um, so Chloe Howard um, has very kindly agreed to share some best practice with us today. Um, Chloe, if you can turn your camera on for us, that'd be great. And then um, I can share your slides in a second. Um, so Chloe is a joint year six teacher and PE lead at Frimley Junior School. Um, and they've recently introduced something called the Junior Dukes program, which we thought would be a really good bit of best practice to share. Um, I think this was used um, in a school that you were teaching in abroad, Chloe. So I'll hand over to you and, um, and let you tell everybody all about it. Perfect, thank you so much. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Perfect, amazing. Um, so yes, um, as it was just said, I previously worked at a school overseas in Dubai for three years, and it was an initiative that they used there, um, not led by the school, but parents had chosen to sign their own children up to the award scheme. Um, so I saw it sort of briefly there with some children in my class, and coming back to Frimley, I thought I'd introduce it as a whole school um, initiative. Um, so what the award is, for those who have heard of the Duke of Edinburgh in secondary schools, it's sort of similar to that, just um, scaled right down, obviously, to suit the needs of younger children. Um, so essentially, it's helping children to learn new skills that will help them to become um, sort of responsible citizens who can do things um, for themselves. And as it says on the screen there, rather than children just thinking that when you become a mum or a dad, you then just learn how to make the bed or cook food, actually learning those skills um, at a much younger age. So if you wouldn't mind just going to the next slide, I've got some pictures of um, some children um, at our school who have completed some of their challenges in the award. Um, so as you can see, some of the children are holding up booklets there. So each child who decides to sign up to the award, um, with which costs £10, they will receive one of those very official looking booklets. And within there, there are 10 different challenges, um, a real variety. So uh, one may be to learn how to cook something, one may be to learn how to make your bed or to put the washing machine on. Um, a little boy there has got to um, learn how to read the electric meter um, and sort of an eco challenge to see if he can reduce the cost of electricity in his house um, that week. Uh, there's a modern language challenge to learn the new language, teach a friend, etc. Um, there's an eco challenge to go on a walk with your family and see if you can collect some litter. There are so many different challenges. And um, as you sort of work through the year groups, they get slightly a little trickier. Um, so Frimley being a junior school, we've obviously got years three to six. So um, if you wouldn't mind going to the next slide, I think it's on there. Yeah, so as you can see there, um, I've just highlighted the ones that we do at our school, um, but you can, if you're a primary school, start from as early um, as year one or reception. Um, so as you can see, for those in year three, they will start with the bronze and then silver, golden and platinum. Um, so the challenges are, are roughly labelled the same, like there will always be an eco or a cookery, but as they advance through the year groups, they just get a little bit trickier each time, obviously, to, to suit the age of the child. Um, so the booklets will look slightly different, but all follow the same sort of format. Um, so what we did at our school is I sort of done an assembly to introduce the initiative and to explain to children what the challenge would be about. Um, and then we handed out letters and the parents had to pay £10 for their child to join up. So that £10 includes the booklet and then a certificate and a badge which will be presented by the head teacher um, upon finishing the, the challenge, the seven out of the 10 challenges. Um, so not all the children decided to join up, but we have about 360 on roll at our school and over 199 signed up. So actually we had a real big uptake um, and lots of parents have commented on how much the children enjoy, you know, taking responsibility to learn new skills and, um, you know, things that will help them become more, you know, capable adults uh, in the future. Um, like I said, there are 10 challenges in each booklet. The children only have to complete seven. So one of the challenges and one of them is like swimming. So if a child can't do that, or hasn't got access to that, they can just not choose that challenge. So it really ensures that all children are able to partake and there's no sort of barrier. Um, how it works, if you go to, I think it's the next slide or the slide after, yeah, next one, that's just the badges that they receive um, upon completing. Um, yes, yeah, so on the left hand side is an example of what the challenge may look like in a child's book. Um, so that's the eco challenge there. So it'll give them a short description of what that looks like, what they're expected to do. They then complete um, 
a self-assessment of how they found it, what they found tricky, what they enjoyed about it, and then some pictures to sort of show that they did that. Um, what you'll then have to do if you're scored to, uh, well, to do the uh, initiative is sort of all teachers have to do get involved. So it was quite, um, I felt quite bad actually. All of a sudden I introduced this initiative and then every adult in the school has to actually be part of that. Um, so each teacher will be an assessor for a different, different challenge. Um, they then get an assessor sort of description, like it says then, it tells them how to assess it. I mean, all it really is is the conversation with the child, um, you know, sharing their, their achievements, celebrating those, and then signing off to say that you've seen it. Um, so yeah, it is sort of a whole school, a whole school initiative in terms of everyone does have to get involved, uh, which to be fair, the, the teachers at our school have actually loved to do. Um, and it isn't too time consuming because if you sort of sh share those roles out, it's only um, one challenge you're in charge of and it's over the whole year. So it's not every child coming every day to you, it'll sort of be spread out. Um, so yeah, if you wouldn't mind going to the next slide. Perfect. So in the child's book, um, this is how we did it you'd need to sort of uh, stick these into the front to show the children who they go to, to get that challenge assessed. Um, so the parts in pink that you can see, you'd replace with a teacher's name. So for example, you choose, um, I don't know, a food loving teacher, and they'd then be the person who assesses some of the cookery. Um, and what it what we really liked about the challenge or what um, some teachers of our school have liked is that it actually encourages children to talk to different adults around the school. I know obviously due to COVID, many children were just stuck in their own classrooms talking to that one or two adults every day. Um, so I'm like I said, uh, I'm in year six and I now have year threes and fours coming to see me to share with me what I did at the weekend, the, the cookery challenge they completed, etc. So it's actually quite a learning opportunity um, just in that itself, actually having the confidence to go to a class, speak to someone you don't know and have a conversation about something that you've done. Um, so that works really well, to be honest. Once the children complete the challenge and it's signed off, I've then got a, a big display in the hall where they go and like put a dot next to the challenge they've done. So it sort of encourages each other and you can see, oh gosh, that little boy's done six challenges. I'm gonna do one this weekend. So it sort of spurs them on to get through the challenges because um, we're hoping they can complete it by the end of the year. So then the next year they go on to the next level. So if we obviously start in year three, by the time they get to year six, they should have four badges to show the progression of skills that they've learned over the four years. Um, what we've decided at our school is once, um, you know, by the summer term, a majority of children hopefully would have finished is we're going to do some celebration afternoons some like garden party, just to really highlight those children who have taken up a lot of their own time in half terms at weekends to, you know, Put, um, to help themselves become better people and taking that responsibility and that independence. Um, so that's not organised yet, but that'll be something we we're looking to do in the summer. Um, I think you go on to the next slide, it's just a couple of, yes, yeah, so that's an example of how we sort of change those pink parts into our teachers' names so the children were aware of who they go to to complete um, and get each challenge signed off. Um, so that obviously was a really quick whistle stop tour of what the what the um, initiative is all about. And um, but like I said, I started it after Christmas. It was sort of something we had hoped to start in September, but I was new to the school, so it took a while to to get that going. And um, so the children in our school will only have sort of the spring and the summer to complete it. But already we've had quite a few children who have worked through all seven challenges really quickly, and um, they really enjoy taking on the new challenge. Um, doing the self-assessment, going to teachers, sharing their, their practice. Um, so at our school this year, it's worked really, really well. Um, I'm not going to lie, it was quite a lot of organising to begin with, with 199 children taking part, spreadsheets, um, getting letters handed out, all the booklets. Um, but it has worked really well. And I know that a lot of them are going to secondary school, and obviously the Duke of Edinburgh is quite a popular award, so it prepares them for that. And um, we have to take up their own time to do things, not just... Um, you know, being spoon fed to do to learn new things and new skills. Um, so yeah, any questions, let me know. I hope that all made sense. And um, it did take me quite a while to get my head around it. Um, yeah, just on the screen there, this is the um, display. Well, it's not like this, but this is the spreadsheets that are on the display. So children will go up, they get a, a coloured dot, a sticker, and put it when they finish a challenge, then sort of, that's just more of a, a way to encourage children to, you know, get a move on if they've sort of stopped and haven't thought about it in a while and um, so that works really well as well because children like seeing their names up on the board and seeing the the progress that they've made um, so yeah any questions let me know I'm happy to explain in a bit more detail or show you the booklets and if that's something you're you're you know looking to do at your school but hopefully that's all made complete sense <laughs> yeah that was great thank you Chloe
Um, I've got a question actually, it's just um, how much convincing did it take to get this um, approved by a senior leadership team and have they seen the benefits of it? You mentioned right at the beginning about a kind of whole school approach. Yeah. Um, have they seen the benefits of this? Obviously, there's a huge amount of physical activity associated with this yeah. program, but obviously lots of other life skills elements as well, which is something that we promote massively in terms of leadership programs. So what would what would your senior leadership team sort of say about this? Um, well, I went to uh, Mrs. Wright, the head teacher at Frimley, and sort of just expressed it in conversation. She was so keen for it. She was like, "Yeah, sounds amazing. Let's let's start it as soon as possible." So she and um, but she is a really supportive, a supportive head. So that was obviously really helpful. Um, but I think the fact that it is very similar to the Duke of Edinburgh Award, which obviously is such a recognised award that many people know about. Um, I think she was totally keen for that and sort of one of our school aims is to help children become all-rounded citizens obviously that lends itself perfectly yeah. sort of moving away from the academic and just actually focusing on becoming you know better people with more skills um yeah so she was really keen for it and to be fair the, the staff at our school have been so supportive I know that Louise is on this call and she's one of the teachers at our school and um, so hopefully she'll agree that it's not too time consuming for her and actually it is nice to have all teachers involved and children can see that um, and really enjoy going and speaking to new adults, like I said. Yeah, and I guess it's really, really useful for children who maybe are less academic because they still get the opportunity to learn those life skills that are going to be really important to them, but perhaps they're not going to learn in kind of the curriculum way. Yeah, oh, definitely. And even I was saying, I wish I'd been taught at that age to how to make the bed or turn the washing machine and it would have made my life a lot easier when I went off to university, etc. And um, we have one of the little boys in year six come in. He's like, I didn't realise it was so hard to make the bed. And it's like, actually, it helps them to understand how much time and effort their parents put in just the day to day life. But actually, they wouldn't recognise until they have to do it themselves. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, I think it's really important with those life skills. So, yeah, the, the senior leadership team are very supportive of it. Um, and it's worked really well, actually. So there's a few practical questions coming through on the chat, um, obviously a bit of interest. Um, one question is, do you print the booklets yourselves and where do you get the badges from? So um, it's a lady called Dawn. She works at a school, I can't remember if it's Scotland or Wales, but she actually runs the programme. She was a, a primary school teacher that just started it as an idea and it then just grew massively over the years. Um, so she owns the company Capable Kids. So if you right. go to Google and type in Junior Dukes, Capable Kids, it comes up. And uh, what I did is I collected all the um, permission slips in and then we paid her as a school. So the school, uh, the children, the parents paid us and then we did it as one bulk order. And then all the um, booklets, badges, certificates came in a big box. Um, I distributed them. And then Mrs. Wright, our head teacher, she keeps certificates and badges just so it sort of, um, children don't just get it straight away and then give it to themselves and they finished it she kept them in her office and she then once they finish the seven challenges she um presents them with the certificate and the badge so yeah the booklets are actually i was really impressed with the booklets i was expecting some like paper copy i don't know why but they're really official i know that sarah came in sarah williams came into our school to see them and they are really efficient i think that, again really helped make the children realize it was a really like recognizable award that actually it meant something yeah um, so yeah she sent them all to me john um so yeah, that was that wasn't tricky at all. She gave them all to me, all the certificates, all the badges. So that was all that was all her side. Um, so yeah, just ten pound per child. I know a few schools um, have funded it. I don't know whether a few people people premium or what, but they've managed to fund it some way. Um, due to the uptake of ours, we had to ask parents to pay the ten pounds. Um, I know that is something that some schools do do. They fund it for the children. So I guess it's something you can look into. I think um, because there's a physical activity element to it, then um, PE and sports premium funding can probably be used for something like this. So it might be something worth considering if people yeah. want to spend. Um, other questions um, around kind of assessment. So how much time per week would you say is, needs to be set aside for um, junior Duke activities slash assessments? So the children do all the activities at home. They're not expected to do any of it at school. And that was what, um, when I delivered the assembly, made it quite clear that this isn't something you're giving time to do at school. It's something that you're gonna have to put your own time and effort into. So no time at school is, um, is for the activities. It's all to be done at home. However, um, the assessment side, we tried to make it so that what we didn't want to happen is that every day a child's coming to you and sort of interrupting your lessons or your break, your lunchtime and saying, oh, can you please sign this off for me? So we made it a rule that every Tuesday lunch and then every Friday afternoon when it's a bit more relaxed at school, um, they can come in, find their teacher and get it assessed. Um, so I tried to make it so that it wasn't disrupting teachers' timetables too much. Um, but some teachers didn't work on a Friday afternoons. So we thought Tuesday, like one lunchtime and then one 
uh, afternoon slot would be perfect and that's worked really well actually and I think that's another another skill for children is they said oh can't we just go today because I might forget tomorrow it's actually no you've got to remember that on that day it's your time to go and get it signed off and taking that responsibility um so yeah that's how it works in the week and then the uh, last question on the chat feed is if teachers are assessors who are the duke leaders um so i i am one of the duke leaders because we you do it in houses so we separated the children into their four houses um so we have the four duke leaders which are four teachers we took them out of the equation and then we distributed the rest of the activities to the assessors so how it works once they get one challenge signed off by the assessor they then go to their Duke leader who like officially signs it off and then they can go on to the next challenge or whatever. Um, and sort of the more the role of the Duke leader is to, we're hoping we couldn't this half term because of COVID, but actually gather the children uh, once a half term in their houses and talk to them about how it's going, what challenges they've done, what they're going to hope to do in the next week or two, again, just to motivate them on. Um, so yeah, that's how it works in terms of assessors and then Duke leaders. Okay. That's great. Thank you for that, um, Chloe. That's really useful. And what we'll do is we'll find that link for the Capable Kids um, website and we'll, I'll, I think I'll pop that onto your slides and then we can share that with people to be able to access afterwards. Yeah, um, any other, any last minute questions for Chloe? Otherwise, we'll move on. Okay. Thank you very much, Chloe. You're welcome. Okay. I'm very much enjoying this network, who I'm not having to do a lot of speaking, which is great. Um, so moving on to our next um, guest speaker, um, another school, another best practice example from Cleves Primary School. Um, so again, big thank you to Hugh Thomas, who's agreed um, to join us today. So Hugh's a year five teacher, but he leads on the active travel scheme within the um, within um, Cleves School. So he's responsible for their travel plans and um, ensuring that they reached the Mode Shift Star Silver Award, I believe. So congratulations on that, Hugh. Um, and I'll hand over to you and click through your slides on demand. Perfect. Thanks very much indeed. Um, so, yes, I, I hope this is, is going to raise some questions for you. And I, I realise that a lot of what... Um, yourselves do in schools is going to be very much based on the activity part of this but I've just sort of given an overview of how we got to where we got to and sort of part of that might well be a whole school approach so there may well be somebody in your school that's actually in charge of the whole travel plan um, and so it's probably worth finding out who that person is um, unless of course you then get stitched up and end up doing the whole school travel plan yourselves um, so just be aware of, of who that person is um, if you pop onto the next slide for me, that'd be great. Okay, so so the, the place where we started our journey, as it were, was well, we wanted to know where we were currently at, and we used a uh, a platform called Mode Shift Stars. So the logo's up there in the corner, um, and and they uh, allowed us to run an audit across the school, and and this was very much a. Um, do we know where we're at? Do we know what the current travel habits of the children are? Do we know if there's public transport the children use or is it even available uh, in your local environment? Um, if we are asking them to cycle into school or we're going to suddenly say, right, everyone's scooting into school, do we have places where we can actually store those uh, pieces of equipment during the school day uh, where they're safe and secure and things like that? Um, and then it becomes a, a question is if, if, you, if you're going to add into that, right, we all want you to be walking to school. Well, what is the, the sort of chances of there being zebra crossings or traffic lights or even um, sort of people helping you across the road, et cetera, that sort of thing, which, you know, those are important things to be aware of because then it might well lead you to decide which initiatives you may well go for first up. Um, and then you have to think about other things like infrastructure, which which may well be required further down the line um, if, if you're going to challenge the students sort of across the board. Um, next one, please. Um, so, of course, and I think it was mentioned earlier in, in, in a previous discussion that the most important thing with all of this is getting the students involved, getting the children involved and, and really tapping into to what they believe about travel, uh, as well as obviously what the school's priorities are and, and, and how the schools want to run things. Um, so one of the first things we did was, was set about appointing travel ambassadors uh, within the school. Now, ours, our, our travel ambassadors are in year six. 
and then they filter down and they're in charge of other year groups within the school um, and, and they then talk to class monitors um, throughout the rest of the school. Um, and of course, that allows you, it means you don't have to come up with all the ideas yourself on what the school should be doing for travel. Um, the children have some amazing ideas on, on what they should be doing next and, and how the school can do better. And, and of course, they're the ones experiencing the travel in the first place. They're the ones walking to school or scooting to school and they can tell you where the danger points are and they can tell you where the pavement gets really narrow and people keep stepping into the road and things like that. So, you know, it's, getting the children involved is massively important. Um, and then, of course, if you're going to decide to take part in initiatives um, about raising travel awareness, then it's the children that are going to be doing those initiatives. So obviously, we want to make sure um, that that's at the core of it. Um, next one, please. So when it comes to initiatives, and this is where the activity part comes in, and this is where the children are being encouraged to, to take part in active travel. Um, and these are the places where we found were really useful um, in terms of helping us get initiatives into the school. The Wild Travel Tracker is run by a charity called The Living Streets, um, and they've been really helpful. Um, there is a cost implication to that, although Surrey have... Uh, assisted some schools or been able to assist some schools with the cost of that so it's it's very worthwhile and there's a, on another slide there's a few contacts um at sorry that i've i've put down and and they've been immensely helpful all the way through um our journey um the big pedal is also run by the the living streets but it's a it's a sort of one-off thing um this year actually they've they changed the name of it to the, the walk and wheel, the big walk and wheel of 2022. Um, and that's an initiative where children are encouraged to scoot into school or to cycle or even to walk. Um, and those active methods of travel are then recorded um, and you, you go into a competition, a national competition, which is being run by that. Um, the Golden Boot is, is similar. It, it started off mainly as walking, but it's expanded now across to um, other methods of travel as well. And that's a, a Surrey run one throughout the month of June, usually, um, which we've been involved with for many years now. Um, and the children really in, enjoy that. And obviously there's other specialist weeks, which we've got ourselves involved with through other charities, um, walking to school week and, and road safety week. So that's sort of some of the initiatives, uh, which I think are quite useful to, to sort of investigate and to see which ones suit your school. Some of them, there's a bit of repetition in terms of what they have to do but it's just different different ways of engaging with the children and uh, uh, and different things to give out so once you've got the initiatives running it then becomes a question as a as more of a whole school thing as to go right well how can we support the whole school initiatives um and on my next slide it, it, there was a few ideas on on what we can do especially with the idea that, that it's about how can we inc increase safety um so we've done things like the bikeability courses, so children being more aware of actual uh, road awareness and cycling lessons. We found for some of our children, they couldn't, they couldn't cycle at all. So we targeted that and, and used some of our funding money um, to purchase some bicycles and actually teach them in school how to cycle. Um, Bright Kids is all about visibility. Um, so if you're asking children to walk to school in the sort of dark winter months between October and, and March, then, you know, we've, we've found ways of providing them with fluorescent jackets and stickers and, and lights and things that they can put on. Um, and that's gone as far now as that we have our own stock, stock of stuff which we purchased. Um, and then we're selling that back to the children in our, with our own school shop. So it sort of it goes in steps, as it were. We, we wanted, off, wanted to start off with a safety aspect and now that's then become something which you we thought, well, actually, we can supply this this equipment to the children uh, here on site. So it makes it a lot quicker. Um, we involve our travel ambassadors and our older children in pedestrian training. Um, so how can they walk to school safely? So they not only get trained, but then they come and help us with the year threes um, and train the year threes and fours in terms of um, the highway code and things like that. And, and uh, we actually take them out onto the local roads and, and go through a, uh, a training session with them. Um, road safety awareness, and of course, with all of these, if you're asking them to bring equipment onto site, 
where is it going to be stored? Is it going to be in a safe place or are they just going to throw it down on the floor and make place look untidy? So we then had to start looking at investing in cycle parks and scooting parks, um, which are which are available. And there's obviously uh, economical versions and there's less economical versions. So we had to do a bit of research into into those sorts of things, which sort of build the infrastructure around uh, the initiatives which you're trying to get the children uh, involved in. Um, next one, please. Um, of course, with anything that goes on um, in terms of uh, travel and in terms of what we're doing around the school, then we want to let uh, the parents and the children know what's going on. So um, our sort of main outlets for those, obviously, things in the newsletter and, and Twitter, um, travel competitions across the school. So they're publicised through um, registration classes. Um, we also run some direct parent forums, which aren't actually uh, on there. So um, it's... It's something which we find quite useful. Um, a lot of the people turn up that we ended up doing something on air pollution based on one of our one of our forums with parents. And we started getting parents that were actually walking into school to to monitor air pollution. So it starts to build beyond just the activity and it starts to filter into more whole school things. Um, and on my next slide, it actually feeds into to something else. So the the idea was, well, how do we get the support? Where did we start? Well, we sort of went straight to the top and, the, and the, both the head teacher and our governor's trustees, as it were, um, were hugely invested in, in a whole school plan and, and making sure that we were really championing what we were getting up to. Um, that then feeds on, obviously, you can't do anything in a school without a policy these days. So that fed into the, the school travel policy and the mode shift travel plan, which work concurrently together. Um, Johnny Ray and Ed Cowley at um, Surrey County Council have been invaluable with their support and advice um, over the over the period of time, um, as have the uh, ladies and gentlemen at Active Surrey, um, you know, just to, to get us up and running and to to make sure that we're we're actually sort of ticking the boxes and, and getting support from them and then turning around to us and saying, do you realize you can access this and uh, et cetera. Um, and the Living Streets charity, that they've been very helpful. Um, we've used them quite a lot. And, and now in every single classroom, the travel track is completed every morning by the students. They just come in and, and uh, get involved with the interactive whiteboard and log their method of travel. So we have a, a daily, weekly, monthly um, a set of numbers and data, which allows us to sort of reflect on, on how we're doing. Um, and as part of this whole school um, travel initiative, then this also feeds into other aspects of a whole school life, like the Healthy Schools and also the Green uh, Green Flag Eco Award. Um, there was a large section of the Eco Award, which was based on uh, ecological travel and active travel, um, which, which fed into that. So um, I think from an activity point of view, clearly the initiatives are the ones that involve the children the most, but then you have to build on that and put the structures in place around the school, which which allow that whole school support and that the sort of whole school backing of what you're trying to do on an activity front to sort of filter down. Um, so I would love to welcome any questions. Um, I'm, I'm sure there might be might be some that you send on afterwards, but uh, thank you. Um, there is a question here regarding uh, send schools and adapted. Many of the initiatives are have. It's not just about walking or scooting. It's also about if you have uh, children that require wheelchair access and things like that, then um, they are they're included within within the data, as it were. And in addition to that, they have uh, the big um, walk and wheel that's happening at the moment. Also has a sideline for children that can't get into schools and are being homeschooled where they can still access um, active uh, activities, as it were, which counts towards the, the whole school. So if the school is participating in an initiative, then then they can they can be part of that as well. So even though they're not on site, um, then they can actually uh, participate, which I think is a is, is a real a real positive in terms of the development uh, that many of the initiatives are, are, are sort of taking on. Thanks, Hugh. That's great. And just to add to that, Rachel, in terms of obviously, I know the sort of point you're making around a lot of young people who go to special schools, for example, um, come in on transport that's provided. So therefore, active travel isn't actually an option. So um, I think some of the things that Hugh's just pointed out are great for those who are perhaps at home. 
But I guess the important thing here is that active travel is part of an active school day. So it's it's something that happens at the beginning of the school day and at the end of the school day. And we would obviously try and support schools um, to try and make sure that there's that activity during the school day as well for those young people who can't access active travel, not because of um, abilities, but just purely because of circumstances in terms of the fact that they have to come to school using transport. So I think there's lots of ways in which we can support special schools and those with SEND within mainstream schools to make sure that they're as active as possible. Um, and I think one of the slides that I shared right at the beginning around the new um, guidelines for young people um, with special educational needs and disabilities around making sure that they're active um, alongside their mainstream peers or within their special schools as well. So plenty of support um, and activity ideas and stuff available there. I, th I think also, if I could just interject, there's also something which um, was rolled out a few years ago, which is called Park and Stride or Park and Walk, um, where children get close to the school, but then they the last five minutes or something, they, they walk into school. Now, not only does that tick boxes for activity, but it also <laughs> alleviates huge congestion in the local areas around some of the mm. schools. So um, you can sort of send out a map to parents to say, look, try and park outside of this zone. And then and that, that ticks boxes for park and stride and things like that. Great. Thank you very much, Hugh. It was really, um, really interesting presentation. And I think just to finish that section, just um, a reminder of some of the things that Hugh said about there is a lot of support around active travel. It's a huge yeah. um, priority for Surrey County Council. and very much for Active Surrey. So if schools are interested in looking at active travel, please do get in touch with us. Um, and there is there is lots of support available to help you get things off the ground. Yeah. No, absolutely. Okay. So I'm going to um, move on, conscious of time. Um, we're on time, but um, I'm just going to move on to the next section now. So um, this bit is around PE and Schools Board accreditations. So I'm going to invite my colleagues, Lee and Sarah, to just give you guys... Um, an update around the um, uh, school games mark and the star mark. So this is relevant key stage two and key stage one as well. So I'll let I'll let them both present their slides and then we can pick up any questions um, at the end. Sarah, I think you've still got a spotlight on cue, but um, it's definitely on Lee, so that's fine. I will mute myself. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon all. Uh, yeah, if you can skip to the uh, one more slide if that's right, please, Wendy. Uh, so school games mark so this is the key stage two uh accreditation so for those in the room hopefully you are familiar with it you may not be if you're a new pe lead uh, but it's just there to reward and recognize engagement in the school games program against a national benchmark uh, so it's a good development tool which reflect, reflects the impact of physical activity has on your pupils so it's an easy tool to use those who are familiar with it will notice that it has changed so when we last had the accreditation in place uh, which was back before covid started in the interim we had the framework so you may have done that as well um, so there are some changes which we did want to update you on and also give you a kind of an overview as to how you can start the accreditation process um, so if you could hit the next slide please so what we're doing well what, what the youth support trusts are doing is they are linking the school games mark more to the five key outcomes of the school games and they're on the next slide so i'll show you those in a moment so it's now less about how many events and competitions you've entered and how many of your pupils have accessed those events and competitions but it's about looking if your offer is broad and balanced to support young people and their development um what you may remember was that you would have put in, you know, we would have input data from our side about events that we run at Active Surrey for you within your district. We would have put in your school, number of attendees, number of boys, number of girls, et cetera. And you would have done some information data input on your side about events you did internally, um, about leadership, if you've got any leaders within your school. What's that now, what has now been done is that they are predominantly being replaced with yes or no answer questions. So uh, if you could hit the next slide for me, please, Wendy. So these are our five key outcomes, and these are all available on your school games dashboard. Um, again, I will, we will show you how you can actually access that if you haven't done so yet. But these are the five key outcomes, and within underneath all of those, it just gives you a brief overview as to how the questions will possibly be structured. Now, we haven't actually seen the questions just yet. We are still waiting on that from the Youth Sport Trust. So we, we are kind of getting drip fed the criteria as well as how the application will look for you. Um, but we are hopeful by the end of March, so in the next week or two, that we will get the final look as to what you have to input. Uh, but 
this will be sent out to you. So uh, as I said, these will be on your school games dashboard as well. But the questioning will be more linked to these five key outcomes. Uh, so if you can hit the next slide, please. So what we suggest you do is first of all, try and get access to your school games dashboard if you haven't done so already. If you're a new PE lead, you may have someone from the school who is already uh, having access. You might need to update that. Uh, the website is there on the screen for you. You can either log in through the top right of the page or if you scroll down on the home page, you can do a register now process. Don't worry if someone has already accessed it in your school, you can set up an account for yourself. It comes through to us, the active schools officers, who can actually approve your um, registration on the site. So it doesn't matter if you've got someone in the school who already has an account, you can get one as well. Uh, so we we'll suggest doing that first and foremost. Uh, if you could hit the next slide, please, Wendy. And then we just recommend that if you are looking to achieve the accreditation this year, it's just doing a few pre-application actions and obviously we'll provide some support as well. So the criteria document will be sent out to you after the, the, the network and obviously us at Active Sorry will be able to get in touch with you and we will constantly provide you with communications about the accreditation. That will be through inside Active Schools as well as direct emails from the Active Schools officers. Um, we suggest trying to find out what level you will be trying to go for, so either bronze, silver or gold. Alternatively, if you've achieved four consecutive golds, you can apply for the Platinum Award and that is continued from 2019 to 2020. So. If you are a platinum school, or if you are a gold school, sorry, and you're looking to get platinum, just have a look in your dashboard, because you will be able to find out if you are eligible or not, and you need four. So that would be from 2015, 2016, through to 2019, 2020, if I've got my maths right. Um, as I said, we'll be sending you all the criteria documents so you have it to hand. Uh, we will also be sending you a action plan that you can benchmark. So you can, we'll give you that action plan, and you can actually input some information beforehand before you can actually even get to the application window just to help you fill in the, 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 the blanks basically and link what you do currently to those five key outcomes. The third thing is to complete the inclusive health check which is on your home page on your school games dashboard as well so as you can see the school games, school games dashboard is pretty vital to this whole process. Um, it will save you time when completing the application because it will ask you to do that to be able to get the bronze silver or gold award. Uh, finally Get in touch with ourselves at uh, Sorry, so one of your active schools officers uh, will can support you with any questions you have, uh, and that will include gaining any access to your dashboard. So if you need any troubleshooting, we can give you access to the dashboard. We can sort that out, um, and those are our contact details there. So very brief overview. Uh, we are aware that a lot of you do engage with the School Games Mark, which is great, and we would advise you that you continue to do so. Um, what I would say, going back to the levels, is that Bronze Award, even if you haven't done this before, Bronze Award is a great way to now introduce yourselves into it because it is a very basic application, application compared to previous years. So if you haven't done it before as a school, please do look at the Bronze criteria, take a look at it. If you have done it before, just familiarise yourself with what level you want to kind of go for because it will be a bit different to previous years. Um, so that's it in a nutshell. If there's any burning questions, obviously more than happy to answer one of us, either myself or someone from the team can answer them. Um, but we are always on hand either, you know, over email or phone. Thanks, Lee. I'm going to move straight on to the um, key stage one accreditation that Sarah will run through, and then we can pick up questions at the end if there are any in the chat box. Oh, yeah, thank you. Um, really, just to kind of reiterate the messages that Lee has um, just alluded to with the key stage two school games, Mark. So for those of you that may not be aware, the school games, Mark, nationally is actually only um, open to year three and above. So... Um, about four or five years ago, we recognised that uh, all the infant schools, the standalone infant schools or, or primary schools with really effective um, PE and school sports office in key stage one weren't able to have access to um, an accreditation. So we created this uh, a number of years ago and it's been, it's been relatively popular. Um, however, like School Games Market has been paused for the last 18 months, two years, but it's back, which is great. Um, so it follows a similar model. Um, and essentially what it is, is it, it allows us to allow schools to be able to be recognised for their current practices within PE school sport physical activity um, across four areas. And those four areas you can see on the screen now. Um, one, one change that we've made um, this year, having, um, having had the pause in kind of delivery, was we've, in, we've introduced the engagement around the 30 active minutes. So the majority of you should be aware that there's an expectation that um, young people in, in primary schools have 60 active minutes um, of physical activity a day, 30 of which uh, should be provided during the school day. 
uh, and, and that's more around physical activities as, as opposed to school sports. So we've added a couple of extra questions in on that one. Um, so yeah, there's the four areas there you, that you can have a look and you're basically benchmarking or assessing yourself in your current provision around those four areas. Um, moving on then, Wendy, to the next slide. So for those of you um, that are new to it, there are three levels. So much like the school games mark where it's bronze, silver, gold, the star mark is um, one, two, and three level star mark. So <clears throat> at each level, you are asked to demonstrate increased opportunities um, across, across those a set of questions. So you can see there on the, on the right-hand side of your screen, there is um, an example of the questions that we ask. Then you can see that each question has three possible answers. So they're progressive. So you would ask yourself the question, you would tick the question that you vote that, that best fits your school at that time. And the particular question you can see there is around um, curriculum provision and whether or not you're providing two hours, if you are providing two hours and how much opportunity you are providing through the curriculum. So based on whatever answer or whatever question you answer, you, you get, a, you get a, um, some points. And those points after 20 questions are then added up and that, that really dictates what kind of uh, star mark level that you achieve. I think it's important to note at this stage that you don't have to answer all 20 questions. Um, I think 99.9% 90 .9 of schools that have applied have actually always achieved at least a one star and that's not having to answer all of those questions. Um, there is a set of supporting documents that allows you to have a look at what type of evidence that you guys would need. And then once you've submitted, um, it comes into um, the schools team, it's internally verified, and then we come back out to schools and um, possibly, certainly if you are looking to, um, to achieve or retain a three star, we, we, we tend to like to do some external verification visits and make sure that you're, you're doing what you're saying. Um, and then afterwards, then you are then sent action plans, um, uh, certificates and logos to help you celebrate and, um, and celebrate sort of the rewards so you can, you can promote that within school. Um, the ac application process um, isn't until June uh, and there's a reason why we wanted to really give you some as much leading time as possible for you to be able to have a look at this. So pretty much like the school games mark, we want to provide you with enough time for you to be able to kind of pre-assess pre or pre-look at what you're already providing. Um, in, in anticipation for that, for that um, application window opening in June. So you can actually download uh, the questions and the supporting documents today from our website. You, you should be set on an email from your active schools officer already. It was sent in, um, a couple of months ago. Um, and you can kind of almost kind of uh, pre-assess where you are before you apply. So the final slide really for me then is just to um, look at your kind of pre-planning application, which, is, which really does mirror the school games mark. So have a look at yourself assessing your current questions, check through the supporting documents just so you can make sure that there's evidence, enough evidence for you to provide um, the actor schools officers for you to uh, at each given level. Again, if you need any help, you can, um, you've got contact for your actor schools officer and then the final thing there then obviously is to apply when the window opens um, in June and, um, and then ho hopefully be able to share and celebrate a key stage one accreditation and a key stage two accreditation. So that's it, we stop to key stage one star mark. Thank you, Wendy. Ah, thanks, Sarah and Lee. Um, what I'm gonna do now is move straight on to the last two updates, which just around the school games and the youth games. Um, and then we will be able to take questions on any of these um, last few bits and bobs um, at the end, because they're obviously all directed at Active Surrey. Um, so I just need um, Katie to be on camera and then obviously can be spotlighted. I just want to introduce Katie because for those of you who have been around for a while, we'll know um, Charlie Winter, who, was our, who has been our events officer for a very long time. Um, sadly, she has moved on to Pastures New, so she's no longer with us, um, but she has done a, an epic handover. Um, and Katie Prescott, who's been with the team now for a few months, um, has very um, kindly agreed to step into Charlie's shoes as event officer. So this is a real nice opportunity to introduce Katie to everybody. Um, and I'm going to hand over to her to say a few words about the school games. Thanks, Wendy. Um, yeah, I just wanted to give you a heads up of um, what the school games looks like now after its sort of brief COVID related pause. Um, so nationally, the focus of the school games is moving away from uh, competition and it's focused more on physical activity. 
um, to embed a lifelong association with movement for health and well-being. So that's a national outlook. And then the Surrey School Games, as you can see, our intention um, here is to create a create positive physical activity and school sport experiences for less active young people. Use physical activity and school sport to improve the wider development and life skills of young people and influence school and physical activity. Um, school physical activity and school sports system to become sustainable so that's our intention at Surrey School Games so <clears throat> given that it is now uh, a more targeted uh, and it's more clear and meaningful to help improve the well-being of those in, um, of those involved the program is focusing on a number of development areas so the development areas that we've identified and are creating events around this year is pupils with low self-esteem those with behavioural or con concentration issues, people with low resilience, people with speech, language and communication issues, and schools within areas of deprivation. So that it's a more targeted approach that we can really try and engage those areas and try and, again, bring, bring forward pupils and, and give them positive experiences so that they might go forward and bring sport and physical activity into their lives. So, even though it is a different approach, there's still plenty of county-wide offers. And what's exciting for schools this year is that the Commonwealth Games is in Birmingham. And in order to help celebrate this, we uh, at Active Surrey produced some um, fun and inclusive resources and activities that schools can get involved with, all the schools across Surrey. So we can go to the next slide, please, Wendy. So after half term, you should have received the Commonwealth Cultural Pact. It was a digital, so it would have been emailed out. So if you haven't had it, flag it up. But it went out to every school, primary and secondary school in Surrey. And it's um, basically full of um, activities that are cross-curricular. So we've involved not only physical activities, but math, science, drama, geography, and um, hundreds of facts and figures about the Commonwealth Games and about the Commonwealth as a whole. So it's a real sort of uh, multi-learning tool that we'd hope that you can utilise um, throughout the school communities. Um, different teachers can use it at different times um, by way of like really generating positive involvement and, and promoting the Commonwealth Games this year. So um, we've also included uh, various um, features about the values of the Commonwealth Games, the three Commonwealth Games values and the school games values as well. And again, features and activities around how to um, reflect those values and focus on your own school values, where there are crossovers and where they can be embedded within the school culture and community. Um, we've, uh, the, the end of the document also includes multiple ideas on how we can leave a legacy based around Birmingham 2022 Commonwealth Games and how what schools can do to, to, to mark that moment in time and carry it forward with um, events that are potentially sustainable going forward. Next slide. Okay, and then we've got the Surrey School Games Baton Relay. So within the cultural pack, um, you were signed posted to links to sign up for the Surrey School Games Baton Relay. Um, again, this is all on our website and um, each active school officer knows about this as well. So if you need more information, just flag it up. But there are links. So you would go on, fill out a form, register your school. If you've registered, you sign up, you get sent a button and a resource pack to help you undertake your own school, bat school games baton relay. So we've suggested that we would like you to do this during National School Sports Week in June. That's it's not mandatory, but that would be great to do so. And then we've got plenty of ideas and um, ways to help you develop a great sporting activity within your school uh, that, that focuses, again, based on the Commonwealth Games and draws um, kids in and lets everybody get involved in a whole school approach. Um, off the back of that, all the pre-registered schools will be then um, entered into a draw and we'd like to then bring forward six schools that participate in the Surrey School Games Baton Relay to join us at our um, festival that takes place at St George's and Weybridge uh, in July, um, where you'll be presented with a, an additional commemorative baton to sort of support you, your um, taking part in this event this year. So it's definitely something we encourage all of the schools uh, on the call today to have a look at and take part in. Um, as I say, even though the school games is a more targeted approach and the different events are going to be led by invites 
to certain schools, this is a way of getting involved um, for everyone to have a, a, um, a chance at, at joining in and, and celebrating the Commonwealth Games in Birmingham this year and being part of the Surrey School Games. Thank you, Wendy. And that's just finally, just if you need to get in touch, if you have any more questions, but this is all going to get obviously reiterated in the email that I'll be um, sending out to you guys um, post event with all the links and, and so on and so forth. That was great. Thank you, Katie. Um, we'll we'll have questions um, at the end on these things. So if you've got any questions on the school games, just hold on to those for a second. Um, we don't often talk about the youth games in the schools networks, but we should do because obviously it's about um, it's about young people. So um, Emma Das, um, member of our team, is going to talk to you very briefly now about the Surrey Youth Games, not to be confused with the Surrey School Games. We do run both, but they're not the same programme. Um, so Emma, I'm going to hand over to you now just to talk a couple of sec couple of minutes on the um, on the youth games. Might need to unmute myself. Um, so yeah, I'm here to talk about Surrey Youth Games, which. Um, um, yeah, so uh, it's got a long hit. Surrey Youth Games has got a really long history in Surrey. Um, it's been going for over 23 years now. Um, and every year we look to make it more relevant and more impactful for young people um, in Surrey that need it the most. Uh, there's a vast machine behind Surrey Youth Games and what makes it happen. And behind all those events and across all those sports. Sorry, Wendy, can you switch to the next slide? Um, across all those events and all those sports, um, from judo to football, uh, your local borough arranged six to eight weeks of free training for young people, amounting to an awful lot of training sessions. And as we work to attract new participants to the games, particularly focused on people who are currently inactive or living in areas of deprivation, we've refocused our networks to actively recruit and support each and every one of those young people to ensure that they have positive introduction to sport. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I don't uh, want to bore you with loads of facts and figures. I'm sure you've heard um, most of them before, but the impact of COVID is truly highlighted where we find inactivity, we also find inequality. And we want to reduce that gap and help children to lead active lives irrelevant of their socioeconomic groups. So in the summer last year, we ran some place-based Surrey Youth Games training, as well as our first programme for children on benefits related free school meals, providing them with physical activity and enrichment activity with a meal. Surprisingly, the meal was the least important factor when it came to the children and the parents and the key learnings that came out of it were the overwhelming feeling of reduced isolation for these children. Many of them had spent the last 18 months at home or in school with nothing else to do. Um, and the feedback came through, um, including what an amazing experience it had been for their children to meet new people and take part in new activities. Um, again, positive experiences. Parents were really grateful of the opportunity and found less stress knowing that children would be participating in physical activity and having fun making new friends. And also the reduced anxiety. It found that kids enjoyed activity and making new friends helped their confidence and it improved tremendously and kids needed the confidence and reassurance about how to be outside in the world again amongst their um, peers. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so as a result of the break in Surrey Youth Games delivery, we have learned and what we've learned from 2021, we decided to start afresh and really target the most deprived and inactive children with an aim to inspire them to live active lives, which in turn will help their physical and mental well-being as well as their individual development. So while training while having training in community locations, they can access easily and bringing the community together. Uh, next. So as you can see, we're really using the games to drive down the gap in inequality and as well as focusing on inclusion. 
And we've scaled down the event. It used to be a weekend event, so it used to be across two days. We've changed that to a one day, but we've really tried to stick to activities that we know will appeal to the audience and are easier to keep going once our youth games is over. So things like dance and street basketball. Next slide, please. Um, so why am I telling you all about it? Because we need your help. <laughs> Um, so you can find out all about it by looking on our website, Specs Over Surrey Youth Games, um, and you can find links to your local councils where you'll find out all about what's being on, on offer in the lead up to the main event in your local area. Um, we'd really like you to support the boroughs and districts by displaying posters or um, sending out information to parents, um, encouraging children to take part, especially those that are generally shy away from sport. Um, we've had plenty of stories where kids have um, come along to Surrey Youth Games and, and found that one activity that they absolutely love, but hate activity generally. Um, so it's been really good for that. Um, supporting families to sign up. There's now a way that you can refer kids um, into the programme and you can sign up on behalf if parents aren't able to do so. Um, and you can ask your borough and districts more information about that. Um, specifically, there's a swimming and walk, water confidence activity. So if you're aware of children in sort of years two to four that um, have never done swimming before or you know are worried about swimming, um, then they're a great candidate for that. Um, and hey, if you love it that much and it sounds that amazing, then uh, come and volunteer for the Games and see how everyone's hard work um, comes together to create a celebration event that inspires the next generation. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Emma um, and uh, and Katie for those presentations. Okay, so we're 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 pretty much at the end of the network now. But um, I realise we've just done those kind of four updates very quickly back to back. So if there are any questions on the accreditation, school games mark, star mark, or either of the events programmes, school games um, or youth games, please put put them in the chat um, or or speak up. Um, we're happy to field any questions on any of those areas. A lot of information to absorb. Um, so if you are new-ish as a PE lead and some of this stuff is brand new information to you today, then please do get in touch with one of the team if you want further information. If you heard about opportunities and activities that interest you, that you'd like to get your school involved in, but you don't actually know much about it, then please do, do, do shout and we'll be able to give you further information. Um, as my colleagues said, there have been quite a few changes to two very big um, event programmes in the last sort of 12 months or so. Very positive changes and is very much sets the scene as to how we as an active partnership are now being directed to work um, by Sport England, by government departments in terms of focusing on those that perhaps need these interventions the most and a little less focus and a little less, less resource on those young people who are already engaged in physical activity members of clubs we are really looking to try and um, engage with a slightly different target audience and and not a target audience as you will all know within your positions within schools who are easy to engage with and um, who perhaps don't want to do physical activity um, but hopefully our programs and interventions provide maybe something slightly different um, and present it slightly differently so hopefully we can get some of those young people um, engaged and interested in in physical activity or sport um, in a in a more positive way. Um, I've got no questions on the chat feed, um, so I don't think there's anything um, else that we need to pick up. I'm just going to share with you um, all just the date for the diary of the next network. Um, summer term will be on Wednesday the 29th of June, same time, four till six. Um, but I think as um, as um, we said to a school earlier today who asked about when are we going to be moving back to kind of face-to-face -face networking events. We miss them. We know you miss them. So we will be looking to do that next year. I think um, we're still probably a little bit nervous about it, especially with COVID rates having being on the rise again at the moment. But um, certainly next year, we uh, dare I say at Touchwood, we should be getting back to normal. So we'll be looking at our... Um, networks, our conference, et cetera, next year and, and trying to decide how we're going to roll that out. And I think the, the chances are we're going to go with kind of blended approach of um, a, a big kind of face to face kind of network conference um, once, maybe twice a year. And then we'll have kind of 
um, intermittent networks online as and when we've got key things that we need to share with you um, or, or anything else. Just looking at the chat feed, because we've just seen a question pop up. Um, are active, sorry, looking at the recent offset research into PE, and will this be covered in a future network meeting? Um, yes, absolutely, Vicky, we can do. That's not a problem at all. We do get these notifications come through. Um, I guess we sometimes make the assumption, perhaps, that um, the schools receive it too, and that you've absorbed it, especially when it has the dreaded O word in it. Um, but... Um, yeah, we can certainly look into that. Maybe I'll pick that up with you, Vicky, afterwards, and we can and you can let me know what would be useful, and we can include that in a future network. And actually, that's probably a really useful thing to say at this point. Is obviously these networks are for you. So if you have anything, we always say this: if you have anything that you want us to cover, if you want any guest speakers or best practice examples that you want us to share, um, then we can certainly do so. Yes, I'm delighted too, Vicky, that there's a PE focus <laughs> at last. I think uh, we have our friends at um, the Association for Physical Education to thank for that and probably the Youth Sport Trust as well. Um, but I think after many, many years of banging the drum, we are finally getting there and PE is now kind of higher up the agenda, shall we say. So hopefully a bit more uh, of a tool for whole school improvement across the network. OK, um, I'll finish on the usual slide. Um, just to kind of share with everybody, or remind everybody the different services and things that we provide and, our, and the link to our, to our website where everything that we've talked about today is on there. Um, we will share the slides as we always do. Um, we don't appear to have had any tech issues this time round, thank, thankfully. So the recording should be, um, should be fine and we'll be able to share that with you as well. Um, but yeah, hopefully you've enjoyed um, the session today and um, if you have any questions or anything you want to follow up with us afterwards, then please do get in touch with the team. Um, that's all from us. If there's no further questions, then you are free to go and enjoy your evening. But thanks for joining us and we'll see you all again soon.